would stand to reason that as the big bad protagonist of scripture and modern Christian belief, that Satan would be a ruthless, bloodthirsty killer who, combined with his envy and hatred for mankind, would singe a person to a crisp at every opportunity he received. Yet it might surprise even those who are more devout that Satan's explicit kill count across both testaments is surprisingly low. Indeed, whilst often depicted as the personification of evil and the tempter of humanity, Satan doesn't ever really get his hands dirty, and the deaths which he is associated with often fall under what some have labelled as technicalities. This is a stark contrast to the overarching protagonist God, whose direct hand is involved in not only murders, but actual genocides against those who have either wronged or rejected him. To be honest, you don't actually have to read that far into the Bible before you find rather vivid and blatant examples of God's kill count. Whereas if we were detectives trying to nail Satan for murder in a court of law, we'd have to read through 17 books before we got to the book of Job. And even then, we'd have a hard time pinning the murders solely on him. The book of Job provides one of the clearest narratives where Satan is involved with death, albeit within a framework that is orchestrated by God. The story begins with a heavenly council in which Satan appears before God. God commends a man named Job for his righteousness, but Satan challenges Job's integrity suggesting that Job is only faithful because he has been blessed with prosperity and protection. If God was to take those things away, then Job would behave in quite the opposite manner, choosing not to worship him, but instead curse him. In response, God permits Satan to test Job's faith and pretty much tells Satan to do his worst. When the attack begins on Job, we are told that the Sabines come to slaughter Job's servants and steal the oxen and the donkeys. Then it is God who sends down fire from the heavens to incinerate the sheep and more of the servants. After this, the Chaldeans are sent to steal Job's camels and also kill the remaining servants. Finally, a mighty wind sweeps in from the desert and strikes the four corners of Job's house, causing it to collapse and crush Job's seven sons and three daughters. The critical passage reads, While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. As we can see, this is not the open and shut case you would think it would have been when the accused was someone like Satan. In fact, from the passage in the scripture, it is quite hard to pin anything on Satan because he is not specifically detailed as doing anything. We can see that God is most certainly a contributing party here, considering he is explicitly mentioned as sending the fire to kill the sheep and the servants. But everything else, from the theft by the Sabines, to the butchering by the Chaldeans is ultimately circumstantial. In fact, prior to all this taking place, we are told Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, suggesting that Satan wasn't even around when these things were happening to Job. This can be further corroborated by the fact that in the second chapter of the book, God actually asks Satan whether or not he's seen Job, who despite losing his family and all his animals, is still worshipping and praying to him. The fact that God asks Satan this, as well as the fact that Satan tells God that he's been going back and forth from the heavens to the earth, suggests that Satan wasn't entirely in the loop here and might have even had some alibi for these murders. Yet on the other hand, Satan hardly seems surprised of Job's bereavement here and doesn't even comment on the death of his family perhaps indicating that this was something he already knew, because he was the one who did it. Some efforts have been made to connect Satan with this great wind that destroys the four corners of Job's house, thus crushing his ten children. One idea is that Satan became the great wind and threw himself upon the house with the intention of murdering Job's family. 
Another idea is that he had been given command of the wind by God for this purpose, and because of his disdain for humanity, was more than willing to utilize this power to eliminate 10 of them. It is with this very disdain of humanity that we find motive for the murders, and it is not so far out of the realm of possibility that if Satan was given the means to kill a person, especially the relatives of one who God had just bragged about, then he'd have no doubt done so without so much as a second thought. At the very least, we have a number to work with concerning Satan's kill count, and because this is virtually the only instance I could find where Satan is involved with murder, that number totals in at a measly 10. Indeed, 10 kills seems tremendously low for the eternal antagonist of the Holy God, and for some, such a statistic has led to an argument that Satan isn't all that bad, and that, considering God has overestimated 40 million kills in the first book alone, maybe humanity has been backing the wrong side. After all, there are serial killers in history who have been able to rack up way more than 10 kills, and they were mere mortals. Of course, there are some theological implications that need to be considered before coming to such a conclusion, most notably, the boundaries and limits of Satan's powers. What's often forgotten about in this narrative, and the overarching concept of Satan's ability to kill people, is that Satan acts within the constraints set by God, emphasizing God's ultimate control over all events. Indeed, Satan's kill count is only 10, and he happens to kill 10 rather minor characters in the grand scheme of the Bible. But it should be remembered that he's only able to kill these 10 people because God allows him to. By this logic, it's not such a stretch to say that Satan's kill count would have been much higher, surely way higher than God's, if he had the ability to actually exact these kills. Unfortunately for him, it would appear that he's bound by design. He cannot affect humanity beyond temptation, and can no more murder them than he could Job. You'll notice that in chapter 2 of Job, Satan must ask permission before even attacking Job, which prompts God to set the limit of what Satan can do. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Satan is the immediate cause of the calamities, but they occur within God's permissive will. This interplay suggests that while Satan is a malevolent being, he is not an independent actor. His actions serve what many believers today see as a broader divine purpose, that is all in accordance with God's plan. Put simply, while Satan might possess terrifying and ghastly thoughts in regards to humanity, he is ultimately on a leash. Beyond the book of Job, Satan's direct involvement in causing death is less explicit in the Old Testament. However, his influence is implied in several narratives, such as his role in tempting David to conduct a census of Israel, which indirectly leads to a plague that kills 70,000 men as a consequence of David's sin. In the New Testament, Satan's influence is more associated with spiritual death, and the temptation of individuals rather than direct physical death. The kill count of Satan in the Bible is not extensive in terms of direct actions, but his influence and role as an adversary are significant. The book of Job provides a clear example where Satan is permitted to cause the death of Job's children, highlighting his role within the divine structure. This narrative, along with other instances of satanic influence, shows us the complex relationship between divine sovereignty, human suffering, and the role of evil. But on top of this, we also find ourselves with a surprising revelation that perhaps Satan doesn't have as much blood on his hands as one might think he does. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.